Hello, my name is Tyler Moore and I teach computer science at SMU in Dallas, Texas. This week we're going to be talking about how economics explains some of the limitations and failures in cybersecurity, along with policy interventions that can be used in order to correct these limitations. Economists use the term market failure for when the real world doesn't quite live up to the models of perfect competition. In fact, markets fail time and again in the same particular ways, so much so that several distinct categories have been identified and are highlighted by economists. This includes monopolies and oligopolies, where you have less than perfect supply of goods. Market failures also include public goods, which don't behave like normal ones. Information asymmetries and externalities. Those last two are the big ones that really exhibit problems for security. So why talk about market failures at all? Well, if you can recognize you have a market failure in place, then that in can in turn justify the need for regulatory interventions. And regardless, it informs how public policy should be designed. It can also help inform self-regulatory responses as well. These market failures have been powerful in the security economics research community because they've neatly explained why private security investment is often suboptimal. Some puzzles as to why things don't work can be explained in the context of these failures. We first consider public goods. Most goods can be privately consumed. Material possessions, such as cars and houses, are assigned to individual owners, and it is natural that no one else can consume the good at the same time. But certain goods cannot be privately consumed, such as investments in national defense or even the air we all breathe. My consumption of national defense protection does not, in turn, prevent my neighbor from also benefiting from investments in the national defense. Public goods have two characteristics that make them different from traditional goods. First of all, they're non-rivalrous which means one individual's consumption does not prevent another person from consuming the good as well. Second, they're non-excludable, and that there's no practical way to keep others from consuming them too. Sometimes you only have one or the other, but when you have both, you've got a public good. And whenever this happens, there can be a problem because you tend to have fewer public goods than you'd like from society's perspective. You can also get problems with free riders who don't pay. Now, where do information goods, such as software, music, and movies fit in? Undoubtedly, they're non-rival. The fact that my computer runs Microsoft Windows doesn't preclude you from doing the same. But software can be made excludable using security mechanisms, such as digital rights management. So it turns out one key application of security is to prevent information goods from behaving exactly as public goods already do. The second market failure we'll discuss are metrics with a, or markets with asymmetric information. Ross alluded to this during the first week's lectures when, when he discussed Akerlof's market for lemons. But we'll discuss it now in greater detail and discuss the implications for security. So here we have a picture of a used car lot, which is the canonical example of a market with asymmetric information. As a buyer of a used car, you don't actually know whether or not the quality of the car is high or low. The market for lemons that Akerlof described explained that because buyers cannot distinguish the quality of high versus low, they in turn refuse to pay a premium for the higher quality good. As a result, the market gets flooded with only low quality goods because they're, the they're the only goods that are being sold willingly. And this is a problem for security in a number of ways. First, the market for secure software and products is a market for lemons. Vendors might believe that their software is secure, they may market it as such, but they it's very hard for a buyer to come in and understand, convince themselves that the software is more secure than, than any other alternative. Because of that, buyers aren't willing to pay a premium for more secure software. If they can be convinced that it, is, that it is more secure, they instead look at other features that they can measure the quality of, such as user interface design and price. So developers in turn put more effort in satisfying the qualities that can actually be observed by their customers. But this leads to a bad outcome because security is not emphasized as it should be. We can see this in other areas beyond software, notably security investment for firms more generally. If a firm needs to convince its customers that it respects their data, this can be very hard, very hard to do in a positive way. Only when trust is lost is the claim that they did not respect security made credible. The second, more broad area where we see information asymmetries comes from the problem where we have a fairly systemic lack of robust cybersecurity incident data. In most circumstances, firms would prefer not to disclose when they suffer an attack. If they're not required by law to do it, many of these firms just simply wouldn't. But a sensible strategy for an individual firm 
has in turn made it very difficult for all firms to get a grip on the true nature and extent of cyber risks. Firms can't easily establish an a priori estimate of the probability of an incident or what that might cost. If nobody's talking about when an attack happens or what it costs them, then it's very difficult for other firms who had not yet been targeted to know what their real risk is. Thus, we have an information asymmetry that exists between firms. And furthermore, because no one talks about when things go wrong, they definitely don't want to talk about what it costs when it did go wrong. So we end up with a lack of accurate information on losses, which makes it very hard to know when past investments have been effective and when they haven't. Measurement, as explained in the second week of the course, is a huge challenge, and there's many incentives that prevent firms from measuring security risks accurately. So what are the consequences of markets with asymmetric information? There are two classical outcomes, adverse selection and moral hazard. Adverse selection occurs in health insurance markets when sick people are more attracted to buying policies than healthy people because they stand to gain more. This is bad because the pool gets overloaded with the sicker people, which drives up premiums, which drives out healthy patients even more. We see this play out to a certain degree in the, in the cyber insurance market. And it's very difficult for an underwriter to discriminate between firms based on their operational security practices. They arguably suffer from an adverse selection problem here too, where, for, where bad firms are more likely to buy cyber insurance, which could trigger higher premiums and lower participation than otherwise might happen. We also see adverse selection in the abuse of signaling devices, such as software certifications and website seals, a topic we'll return to in the next lecture. The second outcome of asymmetric information is moral hazard. There, the consequence is people may change their behavior if they're given some kind of protection. So in the context of car insurance, people may change their behavior, drive more recklessly, say, if they've been fully insured and have a very low deductible, because they know that they'll be covered if they cause a wreck. Some people argue that, that consumers engage in moral hazard in the online context due to consumer protections that, they, that exist in the, con in the context of payment fraud. In the US, for example, most credit card companies may provide zero dollar liability for card fraud. People are more willing to swipe their cards in outlets that are dodgy if they didn't have that protection. And I'm not totally sure I buy this argument, again due to asymmetric information. How can people reliably know when they're dealing with a retailer with good security hygiene? It's just really hard to tell. And regardless, moral hazard cuts, cuts both ways. As Ross explained in week one, back in the 90s when regulations favored UK banks, they in turn behaved more recklessly by not taking fraud as seriously as they might have if they couldn't pass off the cost of fraud to their customers. So we have this world where it's really hard to distinguish good actors from bad. And you end up in situations where ba the bad outcomes dominate or people change their behavior and act badly as a result. The final category of market failures that we'll discuss are externalities. A positive externality is a benefit to a third party that is the consequence of another's actions. But why is this a market failure? Isn't an extra benefit to a third party a good thing? The reason positive externalities cause problems is that people or firms involved in the transaction don't capture the full benefits and therefore they undervalue the transaction. This becomes a problem because many security investments generate positive externalities by reducing risk for others. Now note that in the jargon, the system, um, a system that generates positive externalities can also be referred to as one that has interdependent security. Now furthermore, security, many security solutions really only work as more people adopt them. There's this protocol called Secure BGP, which has been around since the mid-90s to authenticate paths that routers advertise on the internet. SBGP would have prevented scores of network outages, such as when Pakistani telecom had made a ham-fisted attempt to censor local access to YouTube and inadvertently shut down global access to YouTube for hours. But despite this, almost nobody has adopted SBGP because it only becomes valuable once others have adopted it too. So, we have, so anytime you have a protocol where this uh, exists, there's going to be problems with people upgrading. So this can be contrasted with other protocols such as SSH, which offer immediate value to firms which adopt it because it enables pairwise communication so that the early adopters capture all of the benefits of using the protocol. The other case of externalities are negative ones. See, for example, this photo of air pollution in Sao Paulo, a clear negative externality. In general, a negative externality is any harm that is imposed on a third party as a consequence of another's actions. Environmental pollution is a classic case. Suppose a factory produces widgets, but as a consequence of producing those widgets, they have to dump some sludge into the river. The buyer may not have to account for the cost of dumping that sludge into the price that they pay for the widget, 
And when that happens, the negative externality harms the environment, and more widgets are produced than, be, than would be socially optimal for, for society. Information insecurity often suffers from these negative externalities, and botnets provide the best example. So a botnet infected computer imposes negative externalities. A botnet herder who may infect thousands of computers and where the key here is that the harm on those infected computers isn't just restricted to the operator of the computer itself. In fact, it's often used to, for other purposes, to, to harm others, to send spam, to launch denial of service attacks, to infect other computers. As a result, you end up having a key part of the harm being felt by these other parties, and so there's not a strong incentive on the computer owner to actually uh, clean up the, their computers because they don't experience the harm directly. This causes big problems. So whenever you have a positive externality, you tend to have less of the good than you like. Whenever you have a negative externality, you end up with more of the bad than you'd like from a social perspective. We end up with less security investment from the good guys and more harm emanating from the bad guys than would be socially optimal due to the presence of externalities. To summarize, markets sometimes fail to ensure the best outcome for society. Many failures of security can be traced back to these market failures, particularly information asymmetries and externalities. Next time we'll discuss what can be done about this and what, what are the policy options are for correcting these failures. Thanks for your attention and goodbye.